Hello, and welcome to the Resonant Restoration Podcast. Our goal is to engage in conversation with the restoration community and encourage these discussions to better inform people in general. We will be hopefully providing these musings twice a month. You can contact us at ResonantRestoration.com, on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. If you enjoy this podcast, the best way to support us is to tell a like-minded friend. We are now on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, among others. If there is a specific app that you use, let us know and we are happy to expand. My name is Sean Rowe, and welcome to Episode 3, About the Beaver. This episode is all about Beaver Dam Analogs, or BDAs, as I will no doubt be switching back and forth with the acronym. We will be going over some information about beavers, the history of impacts in the United States, and the concept of beaver dam analogs and how it relates to low-tech process-based restoration. We also have an interview with Gary Costello from Symbiotic Restoration about BDAs. So here we go. Beavers are an interesting animal. Love them or hate them, they are interesting. Castor canadensis in the order Rodentia, or beavers as they are more commonly known, typically breed once a year and hold large streamside territory. They are mostly nocturnal, they mate for life, and babies can swim within 24 hours of birth. They have a specialized digestive system that helps with the diet of tree bark and cambium, which is the soft tissue under the bark of a tree. The largest beaver dam is reportedly located in Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta, Canada. It is 2,800 feet and is visible from space. Beavers are a wonderful example of a keystone species. A keystone species is an organism that supports a biological community. A keystone species commonly supports the integral processes of a natural trajectory. We have been using these species as the flag bearers of restoration for a long time. Just think of salmon. The top two searches when I entered beavers in Google are Are beavers mean? And Are beavers bad for the environment? That really speaks to the modern mindset. These beavers. Beaver dam analogs are human created designs that mimic the function of a beaver dam. They try to recreate the parameters for suitable beaver habitat with the hopes that beavers will come back and colonize the area. They are appealing because of their low-cost nature and large-scale restorative impact. But they are also controversial. Beavers have not been on good terms with landowners or industry in general. It is an interesting process because it aims to restore the hydrological processes that are missing and works on ground-up basis. Once you have hydrology back in an area, the rest hopefully follows. If you build it, will they come, is a great question. Alternative and traditional design includes engineered slopes with meanders and grade controls that do not necessarily bring back those hydrological processes to the standards that were in place before a European-American attempted beaver extirpation. If you want to know a more in-detail description of beavers in the United States, I highly recommend the book written by Ben Goldfarb, Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. Beavers have done a wide variety of activities that lead to a bad reputation. Dropping trees on cars, ruining golf courses, flooding homes, flooding businesses, and other instances of property damage. But this is due to our consistent attempts to build in riparian corridors and intrude on the beaver's territory. Beavers are deeply entwined within the history of the United States. The problematic notion of manifest destiny fueled by fur trapping and carving out 40 acres was also the product of digging, diking, and draining wetlands. How could we not be at odds with the beaver? With the incursion of European settlement, we found ourselves in a landscape where wetlands dried up, erosion was widespread, stream and waterways and other features were drastically altered. I enjoy how Ben Goldfarb draws the parallel between humans and beavers. He says Homo sapiens and Castor canadensis are among our closest ecological and technological kin. Homo sapiens and Castor canadensis 
are both wildly creative tool users who settle near water, share a fondness for elaborate infrastructure, and favor the fertile valley bottoms carved by low gradient rivers. It's no wonder why we as a culture found ourselves at odds. Those beaver industrial complexes versus human industrial complexes. What a world. We haven't always been enemies, though. Humans have had past adventures at beaver restoration. Albeit, I believe these beavers were taken from instances of conflict and rerouted into other locations. So maybe not restoration in the real sense of the word. There are videos that can be found online that look to be more like informational PSA type videos illustrating on how they would parachute beavers into remote wilderness areas. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So here are some interesting facts about beavers. Dried beaver testicles were used as contraception once upon a time. I don't think that worked out real well for any party involved though. Beavers can hold their breath for 15 minutes. They have transparent eyelids that allow them to see below water. A poet once described feminine beauty to that of the wool of beaver. There is a Cree creation story about the great beaver. So moving on, geographers at Texas State University and the University of Iowa reported that North America used to have somewhere between 15 to 250 million beaver ponds before Europeans. That is a large range considering the legendary trapping and fur trade that happened in North America. I am more inclined to believe the estimate should be on the higher end of that. The beaver dam analog concept came from the Bridge Creek Intensively Monitored Watershed Project in Oregon. Pollock et al. 2007 has a paper discussing BDAs. They were originally called beaver dam support structures and they were using fence posts for temporary stability. Anna Branch Solutions does a great job on their website explaining the history and concept of how the complex is more important than the individual BDA. There's a link to the Pollock paper and to Anna Branch Solutions in the show notes as well. Beaver name analogs have been quite the hot topic in recent years. They are a great example of low-tech process-based restoration of riverscapes. If you want more information on low-tech process-based design, Utah State University Restoration Consortium has a design manual with guidelines for implementing a subset of low-tech tools. This includes BDAs and post-assisted log structures. I've included a link to Utah State University website in the show notes as well. Beaver dam analogs have become something of a craze. It is quickly becoming one of the most used techniques in restoration through areas that are suitable. The allure is that of cost. However, regulators are still skeptical of these projects and we are still at odds with the beaver from national perspective. Just a couple years ago, the USDA was involved in more than 23,000 beaver deaths that were determined to be nuisances. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was estimated that less than 1% of beavers were left compared to historic numbers, according to an article by Sarah Koningsberg, courtesy of Beaver Believers. Without beavers, we see streams becoming eroded, incised, and ecologically damaged. The hardest thing to stomach is that we just don't have the data or knowledge to understand what was there historically. Our best bet in these instances is to look to nearby reaches that were not impacted, those are few and far between, or to rely on traditional ecological knowledge from indigenous histories, something we still fail to incorporate in a large portion of restoration strategies. On a brighter note, there is a stage zero project in England that introduced beavers which was extirpated more than 400 years ago. I really enjoy getting behind low-tech process-based design because of the fact it outright tries to restore processes. And that is really what we want in restoration, to bring back the processes and mechanisms that allow for self-sustaining habitats. I spoke with Garrett Costello from Symbiotic Restoration, based in Northern California, and his passion and work, Beaver Dam Analogs. So let's give it a listen and learn about another tool in the box that we can implement to restore our wildscapes. All right, and welcome back to the Resonant Restoration Podcast. Today we are interviewing Garrett, and we will get to hear about the wonders that are BDAs, Beaver Dam Analogs. So Garrett, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. So my name is Garrett Costello. 
um, the owner of Symbiotic Restoration. We're a stream and meadow restoration consultants in Northeastern California. I went to Humboldt State University um, and studied restoration and environmental management. I've been doing uh, working on beaver dam analogs uh, for the last five years, and it's it's a passion of mine. I actually I dream of it almost weekly because of I've got the beaver brain, so I'm definitely invested in this process, and yeah, excited to have this interview with you. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Awesome. So. What led you into the field of restoration? Is it something you've always dreamed of doing or is it a recent? Yeah, so I I grew up in Hawaii and so I was outside a lot. And I think that is what led me to just the passion of loving the outdoors is what led me to wanting to protect and then furthermore restore the environment. So just recreation probably was the thing that drove me to restoration, being outside, enjoying hiking and, and canoeing and, you know, just the, the natural run- wonders that we have in this world led me to wanting to to give back and make a career out of it. Also, uh, I moved to northeastern California and I started working for Todd Sloat, uh, Forest Creek Restoration. And when I started working for him, it really solidified my desire to have this as a career. And I learned a lot in that process. So it really kickstarted my business and getting me going with uh, beaver dam analog and beaver restoration, watershed restoration. Awesome. Yeah, it sounds like we had similar stories growing up and getting into the natural world. Yeah. So can you explain what BDAs are? Yeah. So beaver dam analogs, they're basically we're trying to mimic a beaver dam. And so we're not as good as beavers. I'll actually say that. So beavers are the ultimate uh, restoration. They're, They're wonderful engineers. And the best part about having them do the work is that they stay on site where I have to go home and feed my cats and and do the rest of my life. Humans can also play a role in helping to bring the beavers back to the area. So that's why we we build these beaver dams is to ideally help bring the beavers back into an area that is maybe not healthy enough. And we'll get into that later in the interview for why we're having to go into these areas. But yeah, basically, they're just human made beaver dams. That's great. The field of restoration has definitely seen a lot of attention towards beaver dams in the last, I would say, 10 years. They seem to pop up at every conference I go to. What is the importance of beaver dams in a human world or a natural world? So beavers are their keystone species and beavers help maintain healthy watersheds. So the importance of having beaver dams and beavers in a system are they're numerous. Uh, you're going to be able to to keep the the water in a system connected to the floodplain. And so, in a normal flood event, you're going to have water spreading out across a meadow landscape, and that's going to bring numerous benefits: water storage, water quality. Uh, you're going to have vegetation, wetland vegetation in those areas are going to be highly productive. So highly productive wetland vegetation is going to ultimately store carbon. The anaerobic conditions in those wet environments are going to hold that carbon for a long period of time. Beavers also provide habitat from every level of a food chain. Uh, Animals need water. They come down to meadow systems to drink and to eat other animals, birds, and all different things. So wildlife habitat groundwater storage so humans could also see benefit from having you know beaver or dams basically in the upper watershed you're holding water for longer periods of time so that it's a slow release into our cities and and through the into the ocean the the benefits i mean i could go on and on it there are so many benefits to having beaver dam analogs or into having beaver dams in a system yeah. Well, I think I'm sold. Yeah. <laughs> in restoration, we often talk about a reference condition or trying to move back to what a landscape previously looked like. 
what kind of documentation is out there for restoring these sites? Mm-hmm. So when we when we first look at an area to restore, we will look at historical imagery. And so there is a, a good amount of historical imagery that we can look at, but we'll also walk the system. So in a, in a particular watershed, you're going to have in most systems, you're going to have areas that are degraded and you're going to have areas that are actually looking pretty good still. And those areas that we call reference reaches, there's some, sometimes small areas of that watershed. So we'll walk the entire stream or river system to find these reference reaches and we'll, we'll assess them. We'll see how deep the channel is, how it's interacting with the floodplain. And we look at those and then we can model that. So we try to bring the whole system back to that reference reach. You know, there's different indicators also that we look look at. So if we see old railroads or or roads or other you know evidence of human manipulation, then we can say, okay, we see evidence here. Clearly before this was implemented, this system was different. And then you know, we can we can look at other areas that weren't uh, or didn't have roads or railroads or different impacts, and we can see that that difference and compare the two. So there's definitely reference material out there that we work before we go into an area. Great. Yeah. I've also read some stories about people digging old beaver dams in the middle of their like agricultural field. And it's just amazing to hear about those kinds of things that just persist throughout time and there's always ways to find out what used to be there. Right. Absolutely. So what is the historic or current range of beavers in the United States? Yeah. So the historic range is really, it's most of the United States. It's going to exclude, or of North America, it's going to exclude the Northern reaches of Canada, Mexico, and the deserts of Southwest United States and Florida. But how I like to think of, that where a beaver would be is beavers need healthy watersheds, healthy riparian, low gradient, so it doesn't have a lot of slope. They need these areas in order to be safe from predators. So a beaver is going to need riparian trees to eat and to build their lodges and dams. And in order to have those riparian trees, the system needs to be healthy. So the channel can't be highly incised. What I, mean, what I mean by that is the main part of the channel is actually cutting into the earth and it's no longer connecting to the floodplain in a regular flood event. That inhibits riparian trees from being able to grow. And so then you're going to take away that habitat from the beaver. And without those trees, they're not going to be able to create their dams, which is what can help protect them from predators. It, those dams and are able to create that shallow water. They stay under the water and so they're able to hide. That's the main thing to think about is where would a beaver be? They're not gonna be in the high mountains where streams are are really steep and they're moving quickly and maybe there's just some conifers and they're not gonna be in deserts because those riparian trees are essential for their diet and for creating the dams. And they're not gonna obviously be in some sort of tundra environment but really a healthy, low gradient riparian area with those deciduous riparian trees is what they need. And and then then they would thrive in most of the United States. So So that kind of begs the question, can beaver dam analogs be employed in areas where it's only expected colonization? Or are there instances where it's created for artificial mimicry I think ultimately we're going to create these beaver dam analogs. The best thing is that we can have recolonization by beavers. And so when I when we build beaver dam analogs, we're also going to plant willows up and downstream from the beaver dam. And we need to recreate that habitat. Otherwise, they're not going to move into the area. So the ultimate goal is to have beavers reestablish. There's other goals. You know, different agencies like the in California, they're putting a fair amount of money and investment into restoring watersheds for water storage and water quality um, and those reasons. 
And so we can build beaver dam analogs without needing beavers to come into the area. And we'll see benefits as, you know, many benefits. But without the beaver, we're going to need to maintain these dams. So beaver dam analogs are not solid concrete structures, and they require maintenance. So without the beaver, we need to make sure that the landowner or the agency understands that we need to revisit the dams, maybe even yearly for a quick, you know, touch up on that dam. So in, engaging the community to ensure that the dams are staying functional is an important piece of it if we can't bring in the beaver in. But also for those riparian trees to be, you know, become mature and attractive for beavers, we, it could take some years. So we build a beaver dam, we plant some trees. We may have to wait you know, several years for that area to be attractive enough for a beaver. We're still learning how they kind of sniff out health, healthy habitats. It's, I, I'm not 100% sure how they do it, but, it, but they do. They actually can move over mountain ranges and so if we can recreate these ha healthy habitats, they may actually come into the area by themselves without us actually bringing them into that area. A lot of the time I hear about people building beaver dam analogs and they're concerned because there's no colonization. Right. But I like to remember that we're just a blip in the time scale and they don't follow our monthly schedules. So Right, right. And. It, bu building these structures is really fun. Maintaining them is fun. And engaging with the community and educating people on the benefits and the landowner. I think landowners can become beavers in a sense. They can you know, go out and fix the dams themselves. And, or they can have people in the community come out and they can see the benefits. But ultimately, yes, the, we do want that recolonization in order for these things to be self-sufficient. Well, where do you see the future for BDAs going? Okay, well, what I can I see this exploding, and I it's been going all over the Western United States. It's been really gaining a lot of momentum. People are realizing the low cost of creating these structures, uh, lower risk involved, is allowing these to explode. And we're seeing landowners who would typically not be wanting beaver on their property starting to come around and say wow i can actually see the benefit if we if we work with nature if we work with beaver i can actually have better feed for my cattle and there's different strategies that landowners who are, are grazing are doing different things on their land we can work with that you can rest an area you can move the cattle so that they're not hammering a, an air, a certain area really heavily and those landowners are seeing that their their grass is growing really strong without irrigation because we're bringing that groundwater up. When we build a dam, bringing the groundwater up and that spreading out of going to water all of their their grass or even crops. So if you're if they're not doing cattle grazing, it's also a benefit if people are you know just growing alfalfa or different things for for hay and different crops. So there's lots of benefits. I I see this continuing to grow. People are becoming more comfortable with it. So the future is really bright for this. It's encouraging to see. Oh, that's great to hear. Can you speak to the usefulness of these types of projects? Absolutely. So like I was saying, they're cost effective. A lot of watershed restoration projects can be very expensive using heavy equipment, um, a lot of diesel, and these structures are built with manpower. Uh, we're using hand tools, we're out with shovels and using post pounders. So it's really cost effective. So that's you know useful in order to expand, increase the pace and scale of restoration. We talk about this a lot in restoration and money is a big hindrance to increasing pace and scale. But if we can engage our communities, get people out there, I could go out there and I could have a team of volunteers, just one person who knows how to build it and a team of volunteers. And we could build hundreds of beaver dams in a matter of months if I had a, a good team, where if you were to try and restore that large of a system using heavy equipment, it's going to take millions of dollars. So cost effective is one thing. 
it's going to have less compaction impacts on the meadow systems. It kind of ties into the benefits and why they're important. There's just so many benefits to restoring our watersheds. I mean, birds and endangered species. One in particular, the willow flycatcher is a species that requires that healthy riparian habitat. And we're seeing incredible benefits from bringing beaver back and uh, restoring these systems. Nice. That really echoes sentiments found in like low process based restoration because you really want to restore those processes and you don't want to engineer every square foot of a site that's impractical. Right. Yeah. A lot of these systems, they're, they're starved of, of complexity. They're starved of large woody debris. And if we can bring back these animals like the beaver, then the system can take care of itself uh, without our help. So that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. So what goes into making one of these beaver dam analogs? All right. So we've got to harvest materials. Willows are a, a really great material in building these structures. Um, they're going to root really easily. And so if, the, if willows aren't available on site, then we have to find a landowner that has a large willow source. So we've got a, a handful of landowners that have huge areas of willows and we just go in and we give them a haircut and we thin them a little bit and then we can use the willows to, to create the structure. And then we need posts. So we're going to drive posts into the ground. We're going to drive them across the channel about arm length distance of two, two and a half feet apart from each other. And these posts are going to be non-treated. You can you you can purchase tree stakes. They're about eight to ten feet long, two to three inch diameter tree stakes. So those are really easy because they're you can buy them in various places. They're going to be really straight. They're going to drive into the ground well. They're going to have a pointed tip already. But you can also use natural materials. So in a lot of meadow restoration projects, there's a uh, conifer encroachment issue because the system is not connecting to the floodplain, the water, the main channel. Conifers are going to start to encroach. So we can go in and we can cut some of those conifers back and limb them. And if they're straight, then we can actually use those as the BDA posts. I like to use those as much as possible. Also, like trees that are recently maybe have fallen you can use the tips of trees as posts and all right so we go into an area and we're going to drive the posts across the stream channel it's going to kind of belly out a little bit towards the downstream end two to three feet apart and then we're going to come in and weave the willows in and out of those posts and that's going to create a strong wall and as we're doing that, we're also shoveling dirt up against those willows. We're taking sage and juniper branches and other what we call salad or veggie uh, vegetation. And we're going to shove those into the system. It's kind of a crazy process of just shoving dirt and sticks and branches, weaving the willows and creating this wall. The best way for these structures to be success, successful is to have that dirt and sod. We also take some sod from the upstream end of the beaver dam analog, and we push that into the dam to create that, that seal. So basically, we're going to slowly move up to whatever grade we need or hoping to achieve and making sure that we find any holes and we stick some sod and, and branches in there. Beavers do the same thing. So beavers actually are going, when they're building their dams, they are going to push mud with their paws or with their front hands, uh, push and, and get that mud to create a seal so that the water starts to rise. Yeah, and, and there, but there's numerous ways to build beaver dams. So that's one way I'm mentioning, one post line across the system. But you could do a two post line system which could add some strength. And we, we do a two post line system in areas that are very flashy. So they have kind of heavy runoff events and I want to add some more strength to my structure. I may do an additional post line. 
You can also fall a tree. So you can fall a conifer tree or a riparian tree of decent size across the stream. And then you can tack it in with some posts to, add, to make sure it stays in place. There's lots of different ways, but basically we're trying to, to create something that's going to last for hopefully several years. Yeah, you know, kind of hard to explain. I think, you know, there's lots of videos out there on showing how exactly we create these. And, and I also have it on my website, which I'll, you know, say at the end of our interview, I'll give you some information where you can learn more about what we're doing. But it's really neat. And we also, so there's a couple of different ways to, to pound the posts in. You can use a manual post pounder. There's a four stroke a uh, post pounder, which works well, but the best tool is a hydraulic post pounder. Those can really blast through any type of soil because that can be a challenge when building these beaver dam analogs is the soils, you know, there could be lots of rocks in there. So sometimes it's hard to pound those posts in deep enough. In those situations, I may even decide to just find a, a large tree that wouldn't move and you know i could pound some posts in to support that tree as much as possible but sometimes you're not able to get those posts in deep enough and you have to you know work with the system where and when are bdas appropriate and when are they not yeah so i think bdas are going to be appropriate in most systems not large rivers though. So a beaver is not going to be able to maintain a beaver dam in a large fast flowing system. They want to have smaller tributaries and that is going to allow them to maintain those structures uh, without having to constantly repair them. But you, you can still see beavers along larger rivers, but they're just going to not have a beaver dam per se. They may work in a tributary near a large river, have a lodge nearby, or beaver dam analogs are going to be appropriate for restoration. It depends on the landowner goals. So that's one, one point I want to talk about is these structures, when we implement them, it can take a little bit of time in a highly eroded system to aggrade enough sediment to reconnect the floodplain. So that could be a situation where one of these structures may not be appropriate if the landowner or the agency, their goal is to reconnect the entire floodplain or this large meadow system immediately. They may look to filling the channel or doing a pond and plug type of project if they want to see immediate effects. But if they are open to a, you know, working with the process and being a little bit more patient, then these structures would work well. But even in a, a highly incised system, you can still work with the, the analog. So you can, I wouldn't build a huge beaver dam analog that the, you know, the dam is 10, 20 feet tall because that's just not realistic. We would start with something three, you know, two to five feet in height. We would wait for that system to aggrade or to build sediment behind the dam. And then we would come back in possibly and build it up even higher. So there, it can be kind of a phased approach in one of those systems. If an area historically had beaver, it had its low gradient. It has the potential to support riparian vegetation, willows, alder, cottonwood, then it's you know currently degraded, then it's appropriate to implement these structures. Do you have a favorite type of willow to use or what kind of species are around you? I'm throwing a curveball question here. Yeah, a little curveball question. You know, I'm not a botanist, so I don't have scientific names for you. But I'll tell you what, just what I'm looking for in, in willow. We want really long willows. So if you have a really tall, long willow, immature willow, then you're able to weave in and out of the posts with more points of contact, and that's going to add more strength to our structure. So maybe as someone who works in botany yourself, I'm, I'm curious, you know, we are not working with large, because there's all, there's so many different species of willow. Yeah, so around here in the, the willow restoration sites I've done, a lot of the tree form ones are the shining willow, or okay. Pacific willow. 
and then yeah, red willow, and then like the shrubbier I'm gonna grow in whatever direction I want. That's like the arroyo willows, and I know those are problematic for a lot of reasons. Mm. But yeah, willows are great, but they're hard to identify, and <laughs> there's a lot of them. Right. Yeah, the ones I've been working with in northeastern California. I right now my biggest willow source is near Honey Lake in Susanville. I have a landowner who has several hundred acres along Honey Lake, and the willows are 12, 14 feet long, and there's just fields of them along the lake. You know, I do want to mention there's lots of great information out there, and I tried to compile a lot of it on my website. So I recently launched a page talking about Beaver Dam analogs, and on there you're going to see links to other Uh, restoration practitioners in the West. Utah State University has a great program. Um, There's information on there. And I talk about how we construct the the beaver dams. And so check that out. You can go to symbioticrestoration.com and you'll see that link for the beaver dam analog. Lots of good information. Thank you for coming on the show, Garrett. That was awesome. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having this available. I'm glad to get the information out. Let's all keep going with this good work. All right, now it's time for the What's Bloomin' and What's Happening segment. This segment is focused on phenology, the study of variation and seasonality. So what's blooming or what we saw blooming since the last episode? Also, anything else that's in the news that is noteworthy. Phenology is an exciting topic. There are many factors that come into play to spark a flower's growth, and this is becoming more and more important with changes in climate and encroachment by invasive species. So what's blooming and what's happening? So in my neck of the woods around coastal Humboldt County in California, we have the Humboldt Bay wallflower, which is Arisimum menziesii subspecies Eurekens in the Bay Area. Specifically, San Jose, we have the Franciscan wallflower, which is Arisimum franciscanum. In Joshua Tree National Park, there's the Desert Star and the Desert Five Spot. In the Mojave Desert, we have Amsinki tessellata. In San Diego, Fringe Linanthus, which is Linanthus dianthiflorus. In Alameda County, California, we have Fritillaria lilacea which is fragrant fritillary, and that is a rare plant rank of 1B.2. Diablo helianthelia, and that has a rare plant rank of 1B.2. Dozens were seen, but only a few in bloom. Big scale balsam root, which is balsamoriza macrolepis, and that has a rare plant rank of 1B.2. Hundreds to thousands were seen, and only a few were in bloom. In Borrego State Park, there is Xyloriza orcudii, and that has a rare plant rank of 1B.2. Also, for noteworthy news, there are a couple new articles in Restoration Ecology which are interesting. There is Mixing Source Populations Increases Genetic Diversity of Restored Rare Plant Populations and Establishment Gaps in Species Poor Grasslands artificial biodiversity hotspots to support the colonization of target species. The public input is also open for the draft strategy for the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. This closes at the end of April. And that ends our segment for this episode. The music on this podcast was Quiet Fury by The Music Teller. You can find him at themusicteller.com. The best way to support our podcast is to tell a like-minded friend or colleague human interaction is important. You can also visit our webpage at resonantrestoration.com and sign up for our newsletter and find links to our Patreon page. You can also find us on social media such as Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. On the next episode, we will be looking at the Wild Mile based in Chicago. So stay tuned for Resonant Restoration and thank you for listening.